you can't replace part of the brain. Like, you can treat them the same. A source of truth for the medtech industry. Coexists with the province. This robot understands things automatically. Number one show in the medtech industry. So Stryker got ahead of that and changed in the 90s, built a billion dollar company that helped a pie. A lot of things. The state of medtech with your host, Omar M. Khatib. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. Now, one area of medicine that I'm quite familiar with are diseases around venous insufficiencies. For example, varicose veins. Uh, the reason why is that my father, towards the tail end of his career, spent the last 10 years of his practice treating these diseases, and so I become quite familiar with it. The big thing about uh, this area is that it affects millions of people. It's actually quite a large market. And in my opinion, there hasn't been a whole lot of innovation in the space up until recently. And that's where our guest, Dr. Ali Golshan, comes into play. You know, I found about Dr. Golshan through a good friend of mine, Henry Peck, um, who, as you know, is the VP of growth over at LSI and, of course, has a look at numerous medtech companies. And so when Henry said to me that this is a company that's really worth checking out, that kind of piqued my interest. So I met with Dr. Golshan and learned a little bit about his company, what he was doing, and it really amazed me to the point that I had to have him on the show. So in this episode, uh, we talk about how his company, which is called uh, Controlled Delivery Systems, um, essentially optimizing the treatment of venous insufficiencies without the use of thermal energy or permanent foreign implant, which for a lot of clinicians is quite shocking because the idea is like, well, how else do you treat it? We get into that and more. And I think what's most exciting about Dr. Golshan, which I really love, is that I love seeing active clinicians who decided to go all in on a new standard of care that they, at least what they believe is going to be a new standard of care, not only with their time, but also their own money, right? And so still a very busy physician. I think he has uh, three clinics now. And so it really is a testament to his belief in this new way of treating uh, venous insufficiencies. So this episode is about that. Now, before we get into it, if you are a founder or CEO, um, I'd love to have you on the show. You know, one of the big things about this show is that we do this to help startups who are especially early on, who may not have the money for big PR campaigns or marketing to have you on the show and for us to help you find investors, find physicians, et cetera. So if you're interested, check the show notes below and click that link and go ahead and apply to get your company on the show. You know, we get a lot of submissions, so we do our best to get people on the show as quickly as possible. And of course, this is something that doesn't require an investment. If you're interested, check that out. The other side of it is I will be at LSI next week. And so if you are there, please look me up. I'd love to meet with you. If you're a company that's raising money, hit me up so I can see, see if I can help you out. And especially if you're a company that either has no sales force or perhaps you have a very small sales force, but you're trying to figure out how do you, how do you get commercial traction and sell? I work, we work with a lot of companies to teach them and implement and execute digital sales strategy. That means using social media, email, and other digital channels to find those early adopters and essentially sell your product. So please find me at LSI. And lastly, let's face it, when it comes to finding early adopters, it's really difficult. You need to have the right data to do that. And even for me in my own company, I need to use a good data tool to do this. And this is why I've partnered with Alpha Sophia. Alpha Sophia is made for startups, although a lot of large companies use them. The reason why I say it's made for startups is because their database package starts at $300 a month. But what Alpha Sophia does is it gives you intelligence on for the clinicians you're trying to reach, no matter where they are. It gives you really nice overview and insights on the procedure volume they have, what kind of prescribing behaviors, what companies they might be getting paid by, and even things such as contact information, social media handles, and more. Go to their website. Just go to alphasophia.com, A-L-P-H-A-S-O-P-H-I-A.com forward slash Omar, and you get three free searches. Give it a try yourself. Test it against your list and see what you like about it. It's easy to use. It's intuitive and the data is great. And that's why I love them. And they're actually going to be at LSI as well. So if you want to meet with uh, Paul and uh, his team, they'll be at LSI. So with that being said, let's get on to our episode with Dr. Ali Golshan. Enjoy. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the show. I'm joined by a good friend of mine. I don't know why it took us this long to get him on the show, but I'm happy to have him on. That's Dr. Ali Golshan, who's the CEO and founder of Control Delivery Systems. One of the exciting things about uh, Dr. Golshan is he is a he is a clinician, but he's actually got a really thriving practice. I think just recently you opened another location, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah. So basically, we've got a location in Beverly Hills. We've got one in Orange County, and there's a third one coming online maybe in like six months. So we're expanding the practice. We're trying to reach and help more people. 
uh, with circulatory problems. I jokingly call myself the human plumber. So if you have issues with your blood circulation, that plumbing outside of your artery brain, we're happy to help. And uh, in the course of practicing, you know, interventional radiology came up with uh, what I thought was a better mouse trap, and now I've got a startup. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, and you know something. Um, uh, I hope you don't mind me mentioning, but one of the things that I love about your company, and I found this out, um, you know, through through a friend, is that like you're very all in. Like I, I think a large majority of the company funding is coming directly from your pocket, and that's saying something, in my opinion, about a company because as a founder. The temptation is always to go and build something with somebody else's money, but the fact that you're using, you know, you start this off with a good chunk of your own money really says something, um, mainly because you're a clinician, you're a busy clinician, right? There's so many reasons why you don't need to be doing this, but you're doing. So let's start with the inception. Um, so you're an interventional radiologist. You have a, a vascular practice, right? What was the aha moment? What was the problem that you were solving that made you say, I can come up with something better? Or, 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 yeah, and this yeah. is different, not just better, different. Yeah, I mean, there's some people that have problems with their arteries, and there's some people that have problems with their veins. Oddly enough, venous disease is a lot more common than arterial disease, but it's sort of not as sexy. It's not an aneurysm or a clogged artery, so often I think it gets overlooked, even though it's very common. And I think awareness for venous disease has been increasing, even though it still needs a lot more attention. And so I happen to treat a lot of venous disease just because it's very common and we can really help those patients. I also had uh, incompetent greater saphenous vein or varicose veins in my left leg and I had pain. And I was treated by an excellent physician. And, you know, post-procedure, I had something called radiofrequency ablation where they burn the vein shut with a wire. Um, I had an irritation to a nerve in my leg and, you know, it was pretty painful for several months. And so once I saw that, I started looking for more innovative and less painful, less invasive ways to treat veins. And so there are technologies where you don't use heat, non-thermal, non tubeless, which means you're not burning the vein shut, but you're shutting it down with another mechanism. <clears throat> and so I started to use those other technologies and teach other physicians how to use those other technologies and just saw that, you know, the tools that we had in our toolbox, in our, sand, in our sandbox, each had an issue. And while they're great, they have their individual limitations. And it was just kind of like, okay, I think that if I were able to combine the elements of this and this one together it would be you know, closer to ideal, right? There's never ideal, but closer to ideal. Easier for the patient, easier for the clinician, technically easier, less post-posterior complications, less pain, and sort of had an idea in my mind of what I wanted that object, that device to achieve, right? What goals I wanted it to achieve. And I, you know, always, uh, you know, my friends always make fun of me. I like to napkin scratch things at the restaurant or wherever I am, right? Like when I get an idea, I actually get a piece of paper at the restaurant and draw it out. And I drew this thing, two and a half, three years ago. And it was nothing in, you know, the resemblance of the final device, but had some of the essence of it. And the goal was to control where the medication went. It was to get the blood out of the vein before we killed the vein so that the there was no blood clot in the vein after there was no inflammation, there was no pain. And then went to a patent attorney and got a provisional patent. And, you know, was just kind of doodling with the idea. But I think the real inflection point was when I met a very successful serial entrepreneur and was nice enough for him to introduce me to his patent attorney, his former senior VP of engineering, his former preclinical guy. And I was working with some great bioengineers in Mexico. And I think like that was the hockey stick inflection point where the team came together and we had the hardworking young folks and the really seasoned, experienced people that were giving us big picture guidance. And then we really started to, you know, get going. It was exciting. That's fantastic to hear. And, you know, so I just want to kind of summarize back to that, especially those who are non-clinical. So you're treating varicose veins, which essentially is when the uh, va the valves of the veins stop working. You get pooling of blood, which, it, you know, ends up being really, really painful. It's it's a huge issue. I know it affects millions of people every year to the point that, like, a lot of physicians, you know, like uh, a lot of general surgeons actually go into vascular practice just because it's, you know, a lot more lucrative. You see more, you know, patients, et cetera. And so the ways that you usually treat that – Either you do heat ablation or use use a heated catheter that collapses the vein, um, but then or you can use uh, uh, medication delivery. You're saying that your device you essentially combine these two modalities, correct? Yeah. So my two second explanation, my twenty second explanation to patients is: heart pumps blood, heart grease take blood from heart to body, veins bring blood from lung back to heart. Elevators have floors for people. Veins have valves for blood. When those valves don't work, blood goes down. 
the pressure builds up in that root vein and the branches swell. You get pain, swelling, varicose veins, ankle discoloration, number one cause of non-healing ulcers in the legs. So it can be very medical. Sometimes it's just cosmetic. And the idea is to get rid of that bad vein so the blood can't go down the bad vein, bad valves, and goes up the good vein, the good valves. Heat, which is thermal ablation, which is laser or radio frequency, means that you're basically killing that vein, but you're also injuring the adjacent tissues, skin and nerves. So you need to numb it with half a liter worth of tumescent anesthesia, which is saline and lidocaine, to insulate those adjacent tissues. And that's like five, six, seven injections and a couple of Coke cans with fluid up and down your thigh, your groin. So it hurts. And so to avoid that heat and that thermal energy, and also that heat can injure the nerve if you go below the knee, so you can't use it really down low. There's a glue, it's called cryonacolyte. It literally glues the vein shut. But some patients are allergic to the glue, and on rare occasion, it can have other very serious uh, complications. And then there's a foam, which is literally just like shaving cream. It's a mix of uh, nitrogen-deprived room air and uh, sclerosis. You inject the foam, and it goes and it kills the vein. Great technology, too. But there are some... And that foam. Like the therapy, right? When, when you have like, yeah, you yeah, know, exactly. like twisted and it's really complicated, that's going to be really difficult to use like uh, heat ablation therapy. So you, you use sclerotherapy with the foam to collapse the veins, right? Sure. And, and, you know, there's, you know, there's limitations with each one, but with the foam, if it goes to the wrong place, cause you're not controlling where it goes, it can cause blood clot. It's not as effective with really big veins. If you do use it in a really big vein, sometimes dead blood can get trapped in that vein and cause pain and inflammation. So our idea here is to have a catheter that causes some mechanical injury to the vein to have a mechanical and a chemical combination. So it's more effective. It's a one, two punch, but that, that catheter also controls where the medication goes so that you're controlling the distribution. And you also suck the blood out of the vein before you inject the medication because the medication gets deactivated by blood. And also once it mixes with blood, it clots off. So you want to try to get as little blood in there as possible so there's no clot, there's no pain in this color. Got it. You're kind so of essentially what you're doing. Yeah, so essentially you're combining you know, different modalities where you're using you using structural damage to kind of collapse the vein. Is it heat or just or, 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 or a different oh, approach? No, no, no. It's a balloon with a mechanically abrasive surface. So it's almost like you're putting a toilet scrubber, you know, a bristle, but it's really a balloon with an irregular surface. And so that's just basically damaging, scratching up that vein wall. Got it. And then you use probably a certain kind of medication, probably even less. And since it's scratched up, Using less makes that fall down versus other parts of the vein. Maybe that medication reaches to a certain part of the vein that doesn't need to be collapsed, but it won't collapse because it's a lot less. Is that correct? Correct. And in addition to that, remember that that balloon is an occlusive mechanism too. So not only is it injuring the part of the vein that you want to get rid of, but it also inflates and separates the good from the bad. So these good and bad veins are connected. And that balloon will keep the medication in the bad vein, but keep it more importantly out of the good vein. So that you right. don't get a blood clot, and I think this is an important point to show to to, to sort of point out uh, specifically, I think for investors, which is the application of in this case precision medicine is more important because I think before with me, you know with modern medicine it's kind of like a shotgun approach, right? It's like whether it's antibiotics or devices and everything, it's a shotgun approach. But in reality, you know when you when you have a medical intervention, you want to do as little as possible, and whatever you do, you want to make sure it's done in the you know in a very specific area. Perfect example of this is uh, targeted uh, uh, targeted chemotherapy and cancer, right? It used to be like, hey, let's just like blast this area with chemotherapy. Don't want to do that anymore. You want to have a lot more precise approach. It sounds like that's exactly what you're doing here uh, in, in the vascular space. Yeah, I mean, interventional radiology essentially pioneered getting chemotherapy to a liver tumor, or a kidney tumor, wherever, getting a catheter in that artery and delivering a high dose of medication to the tumor but also delivering these little particles that block the blood flow. So it's a combination of embolization and chemo. So you're depriving the blood flow from the tumor and you're getting the chemo in there. And so it's really all about this combination therapy where you take advantage of a mechanical and a chemical um, and you enhance it by combining the two, but you also reduce complications like blood clots, blood, uh, you know, post-procedural or systemic chemotoxicity to the body. Exactly. So it's taking different tools and making it more precise and guided, right? Taking it out of the hospital, taking it out of the surgery center, making it in an office, making the recovery faster. So basically the way we kill varicose veins now, it's easy. It's easy to kill an incompetent vein, but really either the procedure is painful, but effective, or it's not painful during the procedure, but it's less effective than the painful version, the heat. 
and there are post-procedural complications. And so what this does is it maximizes the efficacy of the procedure at time of procedure, minimizes the pain at time of procedure, but then also eases the recovery post-procedure. And it's technically really easy to use, which makes it simpler for the physician. And like you said, there aren't enough IRs, interventional radiologists, interventional cardiologists, vascular surgeons to treat all the venous disease out there. There just aren't enough of us, right? So this makes it simpler so that other physicians who are qualified, who have been trained in venous disease, can go ahead and use these tools so that physician extenders like PAs and nurse practitioners, although you know, there's going to be some controversy like that around that, should they be treating veins, should they be treating veins? The reality is many people are, and if they're trained appropriately and under the right supervision, it's completely appropriate. The goal here is to make better tools that more people can use more effectively so we can treat more patients and make them feel better. Absolutely. And I think, you know, there's a couple things to, to point out here. Um, you know, uh, when you have a technology like this, which in, in a funny way, you know, there's there's a, uh, a prediction I kind of made a few years ago. I don't know about prediction, but I'm really big on uh, hardware that uses software to enhance a primary care uh, clinician's like ability, you know, like putting putting the, the, the technique of a specialist in, in the hands of a, of a primary care. So an example of that would be Dermasensor. Where, you know, instead of a dermatologist seeing a, a lesion, you know, you give this to a primary care doc, they can check these lesions all the time. Whether physicians like it or not, the patients are going to go seek out care wherever they can. So that could be a, you know, somebody who's trained in, in vascular procedures like a vascular surgeon, right, or interventional radiologist, or they might go to somebody who's, let's say, a general surgeon, right? And so... I think that what's best for the patient is to make sure that there is a level playing field and we need to move away from this whole notion, which a lot of surgeons and doctors don't like this, the art side of it, which is like, Hey, I've trained so much, you know, I put so much time and training in this. So not everybody can do it. Fact of the matter is right now, you know, with, with disease, we have to sort of level the playing field with technology and to kind of prove that point, cause I wanted to bring this uh, statistic up in terms of not only the impact on patient, but for the investors listening on market, what's what's the market size? Going from the Society of Vascular Surgery, 35% of the United States population, 35%, uh, which by the way, let me let me calculate that out. Uh, uh, current popul I should have had this number to begin with, but this is not a perfect show. Um, so the current population of the US is 331 million, right? And so if we take a take that number multiply by 35%, it's 115 million people. It's a lot of people. So this is a huge, huge market. So given that, not every, you know, there's, I don't know how many um, uh, varicose veins, tr varicose vein trained physicians there are, but th there's not enough to meet that population need. And as a result, a lot of these patients, they, you know, they don't always come in when it starts to look ugly. Some of them come in when it's like really painful and then you have a bigger issue, right? What happens yeah, I mean, when you, if you put all the vascular surgeons, interventional radiologists, interventional cardiologists together? Probably like twelve thousand of us. The majority of them have zero interest in venous disease. They want to do arteries, heart, structural heart disease, tap bars, metro clips, and then a lot of them work in hospitals where people don't do venous therapy. They usually do arterial therapy or orders or whatever. And so then there's just so few of us. And the majority of people that are treating venous disease are, you know, phlebologists, general surgeons, cardiac surgeons, other specialties. You know, as long as they get appropriate training and there's right supervision of those labs and, you know, the patient picks their specialist based on expertise and training and they feel comfortable, obviously in every specialty, there are people who are doing things that shouldn't be and people who are you know, more trained than other people. But like you said, I mean, my father uh, passed away from a ruptured intracranial aneurysm at UCLA and his doctor was a guy named Fernando Vinuela who had played a role in inventing the detachable coil of Gugliami. He invented Onyx, which is Bollock, he played a role in playing uh, in a, inventing the first thrombectomy device for brain blood clots for strokes called the Mercy Retriever, which was basically a corkscrew you threw blue blind into the clot and pulled it out. And like Fernando and Gary Duckweiler were like the two people on the planet that were like good enough to consistently use this device. And I'm talking to them and I'm like, hey, what's going to happen? And they're like, listen, so I was going to make an interval improvement on this one and then an interval improvement on the next one. Aspiration thrombectomy came out. Had some issues. The clot retriever, the stent retriever, I'm sorry, came out super effective, has transformed intracranial, you know, thrombectomy and stroke therapy. So all of these things are interval and incremental improvements on what our forefathers did. And clearly they were brilliant, 
or we're taking what they did and then applying, you know, this therapy, this therapy, bringing it together, seeing our clinical observations and making it better. And ultimately that's just going to make the Venus therapy world more effective and patients more happy, right? That's the goal. And it is a super common disease. It's one of the most common clinical conditions, definitely the most common vascular by far. Huge market. Yeah. And, and again, like, you know, just, uh, I'm, I'm using rough numbers here, but you mentioned, you know, cause you can even look this up on online and LinkedIn, but you know, there's like 12,000 interventional cardiologists and radiologists in the United States. I just go ahead and round up and just say, let's just make it a solid 20,000. If you take the current statistics now, it pretty much says that for every one interventional cardiologist, radiologist, so, you know, it's one, one of those physicians to about 5,750 patients. So there's just, there's no way to scale that out. You know, aside, and this is where I think technology has a huge application. Again, 30, from the Society of Vascular Surgeries, 35% of, the, of, of people in the United States end up with some varicose, uh, some for, version of varicose veins, especially people who are standing a lot, teachers, nurses, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that was why you got it because you're a physician and a lot of times you're standing up all the time, correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm so, active. I am active. I'm a runner. Definitely, you know, the appropriate BMI. It was just... One, I inherited it. My dad had it. My brother has it. Two, like you said, you stand a lot, and I get the pleasure of standing in lead when I do surgery. So I've got an extra twenty-five pounds on me from the lead. And yeah, it just it happens, and it accumulates over time. Mine was painful, um, but for some people, they pop and they bleed, or there's a hole in their leg. I had a lady come to me; she had a wound, a non-closing ulcer in her leg for like fifteen years, and would just go to wound care and get a patch on it. Did a couple of procedures; it healed. She went on a cruise. She's like, I was able to go on the water for the first time in like over a decade. So yeah, yeah. Some and, people just have an ugly vein, but for some people, it's transformative. You know? Yeah. This is what this is. I mean, not every med device is like this. But what I kind of like about your uh, about this market is that it is a serious pathology, right? Because it, you know, it's a very serious pathology. And then for a patient, again, I'm looking at this from an investor standpoint. It's very serious pathology. It it's kind of got like that. Perf I, don't, I hate to say it, say it this way, but it's true. It's both very painful, so patients feel it, and then they also see it. So if it's not painful, they see it. And most of the time, um, this I believe varicose veins affects more women than men. Is that correct? Yeah, it's about twice or three times as common in women. And like you said, it's so hard to get people motivated about treating a condition unless they can feel it or see it. But if they can feel it and see it, you can easily educate them and the referring physicians to identify it and refer for therapy. So I think we can do a good job at increasing utilization for sure. Tell us, tell where are you guys in your like regulatory pathway? Um, yeah. give, give us a little insight on that. Sure. We've met with FDA. Uh, we have done pre-sub supplement. Uh, we have clarified the fact that we have a predicate in an IFU uh, and that we don't need to do a human clinical trial given that we have a predicate in an IFU that is the same essentially so we essentially have to do VNV testing and a animal GLP study. Uh, so once we're in design lock, we do all that stuff and, you know, we're making great progress. The design of the final design of the device is super elegant. Cost of goods are low, very easy to use. It is very similar to other procedures and devices that physicians in the space already use. So the learning curve should be rather quick. And so about a year away from 510K clearance, and we do have an existing code so uh, that shouldn't be, you know, an issue. So That's it's great. a pretty, pretty clear shot on goal. Um, have a great team of advisors and investors. Where we, I, like you said, I did the pre-seed myself, de-risked it quite a bit. And we have IP and we filed more IP and a PCT. So we're expanding our IP portfolio. And uh, yeah, clear shot on goal. And, you know, uh, sometimes I think you have a great idea and, Unfortunately, it has a very complicated regulatory reimbursement pathway, and that's fine. You know, a lot of the great innovations, uh, you know, drug-coated balloons or mitral clip have had those sorts of things and they've been great victories. But sometimes there are also, you know, incremental improvements that have a simpler regulatory and reimbursement pathway, which I do think makes it a simpler story to tell investors and, you know, potential collaborators or strategics in an environment where sometimes long, complicated endeavors are challenging. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. And I think, you know, uh, it, what I like about this technology is that, uh, again, like on the patient profile, there's a clear need just with 35% of the people in the United States affected by it. Uh, it's both something painful and uh, and visible, 
which again, you know, it's not just incumbent on like a primary care physician or somebody diagnosing. It's like a patient will see it, and you know, it's something that a lot of patients are are familiar with. Um, the other thing I wanted to, I wanted to ask you is uh, right now, like to date, like how much have you guys raised? Yeah, yeah. If you're, so, if you're by the way, oh yeah, it's totally. So I preceded it. That was fine. We're raising a two million dollar seed round. It's a preferred round with you know mild preferences nothing nothing crazy over the top it's all industry insiders you know some sleep physicians previous people who have been on the boards or investors in other venus therapy companies We're raising two million and we've raised most of that we should probably be done with a raise in a few months and it's really just been great fortune having the opportunity to raise money from and partner with people or just esteemed clinicians and physicians or, you know, previous med tech and sellers. So they're just like good, smart money, considerate and supportive folks. You know, it's been, I've, I've been fortunate. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. And, you know, something, um, again, I, I find this uh, to be, uh, again, aside from the, the technology and everything and, and, the, and the patient need, you know, if you look at last year in med tech, you know, we didn't have, a lot of exits. So there were a couple of exits, but they were really just considered distressed assets. The one big exit uh, that was a great success story was in the in the uh, uh, vascular space. That was lymph flow. You know, so lymph flow uh, focused on trans trans catheter revascularization of limbs, and they had a great exit. So they total they ended up raising I think sixty eight million, um, and they exited to Inari for four hundred fifteen million total. So they did two hundred fifty million cash, hundred sixty fifty hundred sixty five million, I think add on. Um, and what's exciting about that is that it was it was kind of like a biotech exit. And the reason why I say that is that a lot of time in med device, you know, you go through the FDA and then you have to get commercial, you have to get some traction and everything, and then finally you get um, acquired. But then in Limflow's case, really good science backed with robust R and D put them in a position where after they got clear, you know, they had one publication in the New England Journal, uh, a big publication, by the way, they had other publications, big publication, New England Journal of Medicine, and then they got FDA approval and then they got, got acquired. The reason why I mentioned that is, you know, I feel like some of those elements are here, you know, because you, you, you have a reimbursement code, you have a technology that makes sense, you have a patient population that's massive, right? Um, so I guess my question to you is like, what what are some what are what are we not seeing here? Like, what are some areas that uh, things can possibly let's say I don't want to say go wrong, but what are what are some areas of risk? Yeah, I think you know, like any technology, any innovation, having gone to business school, med school, they teach you to think about risk, right? Put risk in buckets, and I think that the reimbursement risk isn't there because we do have. I think the market risk isn't there because it's already an established market, right? Like. When you come up with a brand new technology, it's amazing, but you have to build up those case numbers. You have to train those physicians to do those cases. So 1.1 million, you know, Venus ablation is done in the US a year, growing at about 10% a year. The international market is larger. It's the market system. Um, technology risk in terms of how to use it, physicians are familiar. So I think, you know, and it makes it simpler than it is existing already. Um, in terms of technology risk, you know, obviously you want to get design lock and you want to make sure that it works well and all that jazz. But that being said, you know, it's not like some electromechanical energy delivery. You know, it's a, it's a mechanical, it's a mechanical object. And its elements are unique in their combination. But, you know, balloon's been there before. Rough surface has been there before. Aspiration and injection have been there before. So, of course, there's the risk of it coming together in the wrong sequence or needing modification. But, you know, not the first step. Not the first time someone's doing cryo or using pulse field ablation for AFib. So the technology risk is relatively minimal. Um, we have not a virtual company, but you know, a, a capital efficient company, right? The engineers are amazing. They're overseas. They're very hardworking. They're very ingenuitive. We bought some really amazing advisors on board early on, and you know, used equity wisely to bring good people on board. I think like Mahmoud Razavi is an amazing advisor and a good mentor. Daniel Hawkins, Jeff Carr was the CMO of then close. Well, well, that's, big, that's saying something. You have Dan Hawkins. Uh, Dan Hawkins is a is an advisor. Dan Hawkins is an advisor. He's been an early stage advisor. The mode. Great. Uh, Jeff for Carlos, the CEO at Bank Close. Jim Swick is an amazing pre clinical guy. Great. Um, senior VP. Um, some of the and, biggest names in vascular medicine are investors. Um, not going to mention them because I don't know if they do or don't want to be mentioned, but definitely. 
sure, sure. Superstars. And they're coming on our, and some people are coming on our MAB that are superstars. And, you know, those, those posts will be coming. We've been relatively stealth up until yeah. now, all that stealth thing. So definitely have some, we definitely have the NBA Lakers team of, you know, the 80s. Mike Wallace from DeVoro is an investor. And yeah, it, no, I, I would, I would, I would definitely say that because, um, uh, you know, like for Dan Hawkins, for those who are not familiar with Dan Hawkins, Dan Hawkins was the founder of a company called Shockwave, which is intervascular uh, lithotripsy. And that's been a huge success story. And I think they are, let me double we'll check here. Maybe eight or nine billion now. Yeah, I was. Yeah, so they're yeah they're 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 an eight they're an eight billion eight point four billion dollar market cap. So they've done really well. And so not somebody shabby. like that, yeah, not shabby at all. But you know, for him, aside from uh, aside from the fact that he's had like great success and experience in the vascular space, he's also a great med tech entrepreneur. So the fact that somebody like him is an advisor to you guys, like. It gives you guys a, a a level of street cred, right? You mentioned some other great people as well, but like Daniel Hawkins, I did not know, you know. So that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of amazing people that have Jeff Carr was seeing the event clothes, which is an RF company that got acquired for BD north of three hundred million, which uh, was acquired at the end of twenty twenty one, and has a lot of inside knowledge and, and a lot of other amazing people will make announcements and you know make the website available shortly. But really, a great team of senior advisors who will keep you out of trouble. And just some really good technical advisors who just, you know, like Jim Swick and Curdy, just Curdy's such a good engineer. He's been senior VP at Shockwave Venice, which was the first RF company he defined. Jim had Lycron and, you know, he just, everything went through his labs, model simulation, first RF catheter. You know, you ask Jim a question like, well, how do you know that a sheep is the model for testing a device in the superficial venous system and he'll kind of. You know, and Jim's way of responding, because I invented it 20 years ago. And they're like, all right, then I'll just listen to you. Um, so, you know, these technical details that make a difference and are a big difference between success and failure, it's always nice to learn from, you know, people who've done it before you and learned what to do and what not to do. Um, but yeah, I've been blessed with a great team, worked hard and made really good progress. Um, and, and the other thing to remember here is that I think this makes sense because we're fixing a problem and we're doing it in a relatively efficient way which insurance companies love. And yet there's still meat on the bone for everybody, right? The physician can make a profit. The company can make a profit because the cost goes are reasonable. So really it's one of those things where all of the people in the ecosystem win, the patient wins, the physician wins, the company wins, the manufacturer. And I think that sometimes people don't realize how important it is that if you want to be successful in an ecosystem, everybody has to win, right? Like you're like, this is an amazing technology but it's going to take away from the gatekeeper. Let's say there's a CT scan that shows if there's carotid stenosis, but guess how carotid disease gets diagnosed right now? Ultrasound in a lab that's in the vascular surgeon's office. So you're going to want to take, you know, something out of the basket of the gatekeeper that's not going to work very well, right? So this is something that out of serendipity lines up to serve the patient, serve the physician, serve the you know maker of the device. So really it's aligned with the interests of the involved parties. And I think that those are things that sometimes people don't see if they're not like a practicing clinician with their own practice or a hospital person, a hospital administrator, because they don't know all the stakeholders and they forget that stakeholder that's a block in the process. No, I completely agree with that. And I think that's something that I feel that a lot of med tech entrepreneurs, when they think about solving a problem, they they forget about the people who are currently involved with you know managing that problem. And so if you are doing something that's going to, you know, take money away from somebody, put somebody out of job. Like I think people underestimate how strong those relationships can be, you know, especially like if, you, like, for example, if you're dealing with a surgeon and um, you have some device or technology that's going to, let's say, replace his first assist, um, you know, they may not be inclined to adopt it because like, okay, yeah, sure. It saves money, but it's like, yeah, but you know, this, this person has been like by my side for like 10 plus years. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, adopt something to unemploy them, you know? Yeah. yeah. Like we, I think we met on Clubhouse one time and I've been in rooms as an advisor or look at a website or whatever. When someone asks me like a couple of my buddies or VCs, they'll ask me a little bit of company. One of the first things I look for is by no means does the founder have to be a clinician or the CEO or the chairman of the board, but like, do they have clinical experts in their niche intimately involved in the company capacity, right? Well, yeah. Don't. It's it's a concern because at the end of the day, one, guess who the customer is? It's the physician or the physician assistant or the nurse practitioner. It's going to use the thing, right? If they don't want to use it, you're not going anywhere. End of story, nobody cares. 
Two, you need to know what the unmet needs are and what the endpoints are that you need to meet if you want it to matter. So, you know, those are the first things you should ask yourself. Is there an unmet need? And is the person that's trying to fix that need willing to use the thing? If the answers to those questions are no, I don't care what it is. It doesn't matter. It's not going to go anywhere. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And and I, I don't want to paint with a broad brush here, but just as an example, you know, the last 10 years or so, uh, big tech, Google, Microsoft, Apple, you know, the list goes on, you know, uh, they have fiduciary responsibility to grow. They chose healthcare and medicine because it's a, you know, a quarter, a quarter B. Yeah. But the, I feel like they kind of uh, took the tech approach where they're like, you know, we're going to come in with a great product and solve a big problem and everything. And in reality, they didn't realize like how difficult healthcare is and how different. And again, I'm, I'm cherry picking here, but some of these tech companies I go and look at who are trying to, you know, disrupt healthcare and change it, you know, they might have some physicians on the board and stuff or as advisors. And then I go look at the physicians. I'm like, oh, I'm like, this person hasn't practiced medicine in 10 years. They're just like MD. They're just an MD on paper, but like, they're not, they're not a practicing physician. Right. And there's a difference. I'm sorry. There's, there's some physicians who are going to get pissed. I said that, but there's a big difference. If you are an MD on paper, who's, you know, uh, a consultant or a venture partner or something, that's perfectly fine versus somebody who's actually practicing actively now. There's yeah, a big difference. You got to get your hands dirty. And, you know, I was in business school. I was on this venture panel and we'd invited Tim Draper to come and give a talk and he'd go back to his car after. He's like, what do you do? I'm like, I'm an MD, MBA. He's like, oh gosh, healthcare. It's so regulated. So I make this really silly analogy, but let's say you make the best sandwiches in the world. Everyone's going to buy your sandwiches because they have money. You have sandwich. There's an exchange of sandwich for money. Healthcare. Oh my goodness. First, you got to get regulatory approval. Then you got to get reimbursement. The nice thing about our device is that most of these procedures are done at physician offices. So at least we're direct to consumer sales, us selling to the doctor. We're not selling it to this complicated hospital system. But if yeah, you're selling it to a hospital system, then there's this whole other thing where like the value committee's got to buy the thing and they got to sign off on it. And maybe the people on the value committee are not the people getting the value from the thing. So then there's, you know, it's complicated. It may be a very expensive object and it takes a long time to recapture the revenue like a robot or an online machine. So, you know, medicine ain't selling sandwiches. If you make the best app, you will get adoption. So medicine is a bleak and opaque and complicated. Exactly. So that's why when big tech is like, oh, we're just going to make the best widget. You're like, no, nope, that's not going to work. Sorry. There's no adoption. There's no penetration and a million other things, right? This is different. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree. I completely agree. So just in kind of wrapping up, and again, I appreciate you coming on, on the show. Um, right now, you know, you're you're getting close to, to closing out that round, you know, but yep. you will be at LSI this year. So if anybody's interested, they can la kind of look you up. If any investors are interested to kind of reach out and learn more about you and the company, what's the, what's the best way that they can do that? You can give me a buzz, 310-422-0487, or you can just email me. Ali, A-L-I, Golshan, G-O-L-S-H-A-N, at yahoo.com. You can text, phone call, or email. I respond to all. And uh, happy to hear from anyone. And, you know, even though we're closing our seed round, there's always the possibility that we'd be raising more capital down the line. So always good to make connections with people that might be interested in investing in the future. That one I'm close, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think like, uh, based on what you just described and the way this technology works, you know, I would imagine that like, uh, you know, you will have some strategics that are going to take some early interest in you quite quickly, just because the uh, vascular space is really exploding with a lot of innovation, a lot of investment money and everything. I think it was the second or third most funded uh, space and med devices last year. I think number one, number one and two were ortho and neuro. I think number three was, was cardiovascular, you know? So I mean, there's been some interesting exits in the Venus space in the not too recent past that were quite healthy, that are good comps for our device. And we've definitely had some interest, early interest from some, you know, really great strategics. And obviously, you know, it's not over till it's over, but, uh, and there's still work to be done. But yeah, I think we're in a niche where a lot of companies could potentially benefit from having an additional or their first superficial Venus therapy device. And the other way to look at it is I think a lot of companies have a bag of goods that they want to get into a physician's lab or office. And almost everybody treats venous disease and almost everybody has venous disease. So it's sort of like the Trojan horse to get in all of your other stuff, right? Like a closure device. Everybody uses closure devices because everybody's holes and heart. So if you have a closure device, people are likely to use your closure device. And then you get in front of that person and you're like, oh, check out this other thing or this other other thing. Versus if you have a very unique 
niche object that not a lot of people are going to want to use, then you're only going to get in front of a super minority of physicians. So it's kind of like ubiquitous in the Trojan horse. So I think it makes sense from that perspective. Oh, no, I completely agree. And I think especially when you're selling, because uh, when you sell directly to uh, a physician who does these procedures in office, it is very much like a direct-to-consumer play. You don't have the complexity of a back committee, all these different things. Part of it is just like, okay, what's going to get me in front of this physician? And then a lot of times, for the most part, uh, a lot of devices within a physician's uh, facility are, are some better than the others, but yeah, it's marginal. And so a lot of times it's just like, what's going to be the easiest um, who can who can bundle me an offer and who do I like doing business with? And so I like the Trojan horse analogy. I completely agree. I think um, a device like this, uh, given that it goes through regulatory pathway, everything's smooth, it works well, people, and the physicians start adopting it, um, is a great land and expand uh, uh, strategy for, for, uh, for, for other companies who have other a suite of products that kind of help serve a venous patient. And no durable medical yeah. equipment. Right? You don't need to buy that box that generates that signal or that image or... You know, that's a great energy, thing. right? It's just you already, every vascular physician already has ultrasound and a way to get the patients like sterile for every procedure. So it's, yeah, it's not a capital, capital it's not a in per, uh, sale, is it? Equipment. And it isn't uh, like some realities where you're like, oh, you have to get this thing and you it's good for umpteen procedures, right? It's like you get one catheter, you can do one procedure. You want to buy 50 catheters, you can do 50 procedures. So low cost of entry, easy to try. I think most physicians are hesitant to buy a box or a gizmo it takes up space there's a commitment it doesn't work out now they're stuck with it it didn't work out in the past but you try it you like it you try it more i think you know decreasing the activation energy for a physician to try something is important because you're inundated with things options etc you're like hey just try this you try it and it works better you try it a second or a third time if you like it well, you're probably not hooked but you're getting there Fantastic. I, I love it. Well, Ali, I'm really happy to have you on the show. Looking forward to having you back for some updates and I'll be seeing you at LSI uh, in data point this Same year. Brother. Really looking forward to a beautiful meeting and I really appreciate you taking the time. You do such a beautiful job and I love your podcast and oh, honor you, and pleasure to be on board. I really, I really appreciate it. I appreciate it, brother. It's, it's, it's right. It's a mutual feeling. So with that being said, uh, if you're listening to the episode, be sure to go and give Ali a follow and connect with him on LinkedIn. Uh, and if you're a listener of this show, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the, to the show. Give us five stars and write a review. I'm your host, Omar Khatib, and we'll see you all next time. Thank you for enjoying another epic episode of The State of MedTech. If you're feeling inspired and love this episode, do us a favor. Hit that subscribe button and turn notifications on so you never miss an episode. And be sure to give us five stars and write a short review because that helps more people discover this amazing community of ours. If you're a company who has an executive that you'd like to be on the show or perhaps you want to sponsor one of the episodes, shoot us an email at hello at Take care and we'll see you next time.